So I wanna talk a little bit about, first start about your life, because I think your career is really interesting for people, and then we're gonna talk about education, other issues, and open it up to the group. So you, you grew up in Texas. I did. And I read, read in your background, your father was a sharecropper. He was uh, b until we moved to Houston, uh, and he got a job as a janitor at Bama, uh, which makes wonderful jellies and so forth. Bama, yeah? Um, and, uh, uh, and so for the rest of his uh, working life, uh, he, he worked at Bama. And so what, uh, what prompted you, or, or what led to you becoming, uh, going into career in academia and becoming a professor? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> Well, I guess the short version of it is that um, I started my life on this farm in East Texas, Grapeland, a tiny place, but uh, actually the farm that we were on um, had 100 families on it. It's a very big farm. Uh, and so I was the youngest of 12 children. I mean, I am the youngest. I still am. Uh, <laughs> they remind me of that all the time. Um, and uh, when I grew up, I grew up like so many of, m of my students today in an environment of want. Hmm. And so not having anything, um, uh, I was in enchanted when I went to school uh, hmm. with this place. Uh, where uh, you didn't have to go out and work in the fields, um, and you didn't have to do uh, farm chores. You could actually go to school and learn, and then there's a wonderful mediator in the middle of all of this who loved learning, and any time that you did something that was um, good in terms of learning, you felt that you were at the top of the mountain. So that first experience that I had with Miss Ida Mae Henderson uh, in Grapeland really started me on that path. I loved it, and when I came to Houston, when my family moved to Houston, I had uh, more incredibly inspiring teachers. Uh, we came to Houston, as you might imagine, from the country, uh, country bumpkins, um, didn't fit in but it was glorious because as much as we didn't fit in and we didn't have the right clothes and the right hairstyles and all that, as soon as I got to school, I was a star. And so, uh, and so this whole idea that uh, however people treat you, whatever you have, whatever you possess, your intellect gives you the ability to be on a par with anybody. So I learned that very early on as a child. And uh, when I learned that and the, the power of learning and the power of knowledge, I just never wanted to leave that. And so when I graduated from, uh, from high school, I went on to college. And then uh, at, the college, at the college level, um, I, I have to say I was propelled further um, into graduate school, mostly because of the recognition I got as a, as a, as a student, and I just got I got all of these fellowships so that I could go to graduate school free. And so it seemed kind of churlish not to use them. And so, uh, so I went to France for a year um, uh, on a Fulbright uh, fellowship and then I came back and I had gotten married by then and because my husband got into um, Boston University, I finally decided to go to Harvard because it was in the same location. <laughs> And, and so... Uh, I always wondered why people go to Harvard, and I guess that's, yeah. that's why. Well, <laughs> it was... So that's why they go to Harvard. Yeah, it was, it was practical, right? No, but... So, and so, um, so, but even when I was at Harvard, I have to say that my faculty at Harvard didn't think I could make a go of it as a professor, huh. because at the time, it was such an unusual thing. And I was always an odd duck. And being, first of all, African-American in my program as the only African-American huh. uh, at the time, and being in romance languages and literatures, huh. what is that all about? Huh. I mean, and so I still get those questions today. 
what on earth were you doing in Romance Languages as an African American? Um, and you know, why? Um, and so, uh, so they didn't think that there was much chance that I would make it. Uh, they confessed that to me later. Um, that, uh, but, and so, but I stuck with it, and then I left there, and I got a job as a professor, and I, that, my career started. And for those who do, follow, it's pre pretty interesting. Cal State. Yes. Then USC, then Princeton, where you're dean of faculty. Spelman, where you're provost. Uh, then back to Princeton as vice provost. Then to Smith College. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Smith, I think uh, you, you became uh, the head of Smith. Yes. First African-American uh, person to um, be uh, the head of a Ivy League school. And then you spent 12 years at Brown. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would say, uh, and then we're going to get to how you came back to Texas in a moment, but you were uh, the head of Brown until 2012. Uh, what's the most important lesson or experience you'd want to relate to, to the group here about what you learned from all those experiences in leadership? Um, I would say looking back today, um, and I, I really do impart this to my students at Prairie View, Looking back today, I have to say I was dead wrong about every conclusion that I drew mm. as I was coming along. Um, I grew up under segregation, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, many decisions in my early life were based on the fact that our country was deeply divided and segregated. Um, and so I learned to adjust to the fact that I was going to suffer discrimination, and therefore I set my sights accordingly. And so when I started my profession, I naturally said to myself, well, you know, I, I would never be able to rise to a very high office. Right. Um, and so I did my best to try to make a difference every place that I went um, and to be authentic, especially because of all those students who were coming along after me. And I was trying to influence the students to understand that they had an opportunity and they should avail themselves of that opportunity, but I never thought I would be able to become a college president. And so I guess the most uh, important thing to say uh, is that um, when you start on that path to learning and you work hard at it and you get better at it, um, there really aren't, um, there aren't um, ceilings, really, unless you impose them on yourself. So I was lucky because there were people all around me who insisted that my own thoughts about what I couldn't do were invalid. And there was a gentleman named uh, Aaron Lemonick at, uh, at Princeton. We had very little ostensibly uh, in common. Um, I was uh, you know, obviously reared in the South, African-American. Uh, Baptist, uh, he was reared in Philadelphia, um, he was Jewish, um, but he was my supervisor at Princeton. And he absolutely pushed me to do more than I thought I could. And more, more importantly, he also criticized me. And a lot of what happens to women and minorities in the workplace is that people kind of tiptoe around us and they won't tell us the truth. So when we're performing poorly, they don't tell us. Um, but others, they go and they say, look, you know, you need to do this, and you'll improve if you do that. But we don't get that because there's a kind of barrier that says, no, you better not say that. Uh, well, he broke all those barriers. Hmm. And I remember one day he, I had worked up a spreadsheet on, on salaries. I did the faculty salaries at Princeton. And uh, I gave it to him, and he said it was the worst. I won't tell you what he truly said, because <laughs> he swore he swore a lot. Um, and, uh, and so he said it was the worst thing he had ever seen, ever, ever, in all of his This is when career. you were provost or before you became this provost? Is, this is when I was associate dean of the faculty. Got it, wow. And he said it, 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 was, it was awful. <laughs> And he, not only to punctuate that, yeah. he kicked the furniture. Wow. Um, he was a very imposing man. And I was, we were working late. I was there with him alone. I was terrified. But anyway, so he said it was the worst thing he'd ever seen. So and I, he was your boss. My boss. 
And so I did what any respectable person would do. I went back to my office and put my head on my desk and cried. <laughs> and uh, I cried and cried and cried. Um, uh, but then I got up and redid it. Um, and because he would tell me when I needed to improve, oh my goodness, what a blessing that was. And that uh, helped you later when you became university president? Well, it helped me, first of all, to advance yeah. because um, I became um, uh, good at what I did and better than most, uh, and I gained a reputation for what I did because I did it well, thanks to him. Yeah. Um, and the final thing he did for me um, is he, he um, when I got the offer to go to Smith, they asked me if I would come to be president, and I said, I said no. I was, I, I turned, I, I was going to turn it down. And um, I, I don't know why. I, I was going to turn it down because I didn't think that they understood who I was. Okay. And that they were fully prepared to have somebody like me be their president. And so I decided, no, that was not a good idea. So he took me to lunch. Uh, and he told me I was an idiot. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and, but he said the most important thing he said is, you think you're staying at Princeton because Princeton needs you. Yeah. But Princeton has been here for 250 years and if you leave, <laughs> they will hardly notice that you're gone. <laughs> and so- So, so uh, that prompted you to say I yes. I immediately accepted Smith, yeah. So. <laughs> Did you go to him when you got the offer from Brown? Uh, I, I didn't. The, the offer from Brown w was constructed somewhat differently because I, once I made a decision to be at Smith, I wanted to be there forever. Right. Um, and I was, uh, I was worried, I was so worried about disappointing the students. Right. And so again, I said, no, I, right. I wouldn't leave. Right. Um, and um, they did something very clever. They sent the former president of Cornell to come and speak with me and convince me that it was respectable, given what I had done to date at Smith, for me to leave. Wow. Um, but that was, still, that was still not enough. But there was a wonderful woman who was on the Smith board who was African American. And she came to me and said the following thing, which was really amazing. Uh, she said, Ruth, we would love to have you stay at Smith for the rest of your career. But if you ever get the opportunity to be president of an Ivy League university as the first African American to break that barrier, you must go. Wow. And so uh, she gave me permission to, to do it. Wow. Uh, by, by saying that. And so finally, I, you know, I acceded. Uh, but I didn't know anything about Brown. I had never. Uh, been on the campus. I had never, it, so it was a real question in my mind whether or not there was a fit between mm -hmm. me and Brown. Okay. And I just took it on faith that it was, mm -hmm. uh, and I went, and it was a wonderful experience. And so you were you retired, uh, and I'm, I'm expediting this because we could talk about a lot more, but given the uh, constraints of time, you retired then, came back to Texas, yes, and then how did it happen that you came to Prairie View? Um, well, I was, I was retired in Texas because, you know, I had been away from Texas since I was 17 years old. Yeah. And I was, I, I was longing for it. Um, hmm. You know, growing up here uh, and being a part of the state and the culture, it, it, it meant a lot to me. And then I had all these family members here. So I desperate, I longed for to be back. So I was happy to come back, and I was settling into doing a few things that um, were uh, satisfying, but but not you know not a full time position. I got offers to um, to, uh, to uh, for other presidencies, and I immediately said no, I wouldn't do them. I was very firm, um, but um, <laughs> John Sharp called me one day. Uh, do you know him at all? I don't. I don't think uh, I do. Okay. Well. It, <laughs> It's, uh, he's, he's, pretty, uh, he's pretty incredible. But anyway, so he called me one day and, uh, uh, and, and said, you know, we're having problems, uh, you know, in, in the A&M system. And I wonder if you could give us some advice. And 
that's not unusual. I got calls mm -hmm. like that all the time. And mm -hmm. so I thought, hmm. sure. And so he flew down from College Station to Houston. <laughs> I, I don't know. So I met him in the airport. He had re reserved a room. And he, um, uh, he, you know, as a politician, he's very efficient. Uh, he came right to the point. Uh, he, I walked in and he said, uh, let me get to the point. I'm here to ask if you would be willing to serve as interim president of Prairie View. Well, I mean, after all, uh -huh. this guy, whom I didn't know, had just flown from College Station to Houston. <laughs> and so uh, I knew I was going to say no, but I didn't want to do it right then and there because, after all, he had just flown from College Station. <laughs> and so I mentally said, you know, all I can say at this point is I won't say no immediately. You know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, my field is literature, so I use words very carefully. And so when I said I, I'm not going to say no immediately, that meant I'm going to say no, but I'm not going to say it immediately. Um, and so, uh, so we, uh, he said, okay, and then he laughed. I wouldn't think that's the way he took it. Uh, he would never, <laughs> he would never take anything like that. Yeah. Um, so, um, so the next step was, um, you know, to have a follow-up conversation, and mm -hmm. he took me to the campus. Okay. With it in a in a, um, a, a car with uh, very dark windows, because mm -hmm. um, he didn't want anybody to see me at right. Prairie View and know that this was, you know, underway. Nobody would have recognized me, but I mean, he thought it was this, it was very cloak and dagger. Um, and, and so uh, we met at Bucky's and they drove me to camp. <laughs> what? <laughs> and and they, drove, they drove me to campus and they, you know, and they gave me a tour and they talked about all the great things at Prairie View and so forth. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then I made a critical mistake. Um, and that is, I, I didn't know what to do about this because it, it was so odd to me that someone would approach me to do this. So I went to my brother, the only person I knew who knew anything about Prairie View, yeah. um, uh, because he was a Prairie View alum. Big mistake. So I said to him, <laughs> I said, uh, you'll never believe what happened. They've asked me to become interim president at, uh, at Prairie View. And he said, well, you have to do it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, now, you have to understand my family and the dynamics. So I've got these seven brothers, uh, we are five sisters, seven brothers, and the brothers in a male-dominated culture, you know, they always just tell us what to do as, as, as girls. And so, um, so he then, and when I told him it would be strictly confidential, uh -huh. uh, exactly. Okay, so he immediately told everybody else, um, and they ganged up on me. Uh, about doing it, and so my family really started. You've got to do it because you know. And no, this is the other thing he said was outrageous. He, by the way, he's a he's a troglodyte, so be prepared for this. So, so he said um, he said besides, you've never done anything for black people. <laughs> That's right. what he said. He said you have to do it because you've never done anything for black people. I said. But what are you talking about? I said, but he meant because I had been at Princeton and Smith and Brown and, and so forth. So I, I was, to him, I was illegitimate because I had, I had done those things and I had never done anything for black people. So you went back and you accepted. I did. And that was in 2017. Yes. Uh, and you might just give two or three, you and I have talked a lot about Prairie View and some of the challenges and the nature of the students and some of the challenges they have. What, just two or three facts about, just for the headline, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the issues. What, describe Prairie first View. Of all, the... First of all, it, it is, um, the students at Prairie View are phenomenal. Um, they come from all over the country, but uh, many of them come from the state of Texas. And when I walk across the campus, you know what I see? I see people who are just like I was right. when I was coming along. Wow. Just, I mean, so, the, mm. so, so they, are, they are just, so I can relate completely to the fact 
that they on their shoulders rests the possibility for them to lift their entire family. Many of them first in their family to go to college? Yes. Yeah. Many of the first in their family. And of course we have others who have had six generations go to Prairie View. Yeah. So they, so there's a real mix. Yeah. But we still are in that incredible position to be able to offer opportunities for young people who come without the means to advance. Um, uh, and that social mobility is the most important aspect of our mission. It was when we were founded, um, right out of slavery. It continues to be uh, the thing that motivates us so, so, uh, so strongly. So, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, we have, we, we graduate a huge number of engineers yeah. and architects and nurses. And we have been doing that for quite a while. And so we have made um, a, a very successful, uh, very um, deep imprint on the state of Texas in those professions. Mm. Um, and so, but many people who are practicing in those areas come from that kind of background. They have been first generation students who've moved on to these professions and who've made careers that have been outstanding. The other thing um, that you know, I've, I've come to understand is, you know, when I was in college, I, uh, I, they now have this wonderful GoFundMe practice. Right. Um, but I knew about GoFundMe before uh, the internet because when I was in college, I didn't have a dime. And so, uh, but I understood everybody I knew was poor. And so I'd write letters and ask people individually for a dollar or two dollars or five dollars. That's how I got through college. Uh, so, so a lot of our students are like that. They're on, they're on the edge financially. Right. And, and, and sometimes they even have to drop out because they cannot find anybody who can give them $200 for what they need for that moment, and so on. So, so we have great um, uh, financial need uh, yeah. for uh, among our students. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's it the fantastic, uh, inspiring uh, students who are committed to doing civic uh, service. So, one thing I just want to touch on because it re relates to we, we've talked a lot uh, over the last several years about the fact that the graduation rate in the United States, but certainly in Texas, in students graduating even within six years of college is, is, is poor. And I know you have that challenge, and you and I yes. have talked about, explain a lot of it is just lack, people run out of money. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it is people are very close to the edge yeah. uh, in terms of finances. Yeah. Okay. And and you know there are heartbreaking stories uh, that students bring to me all the time, where they've used some part of their financial aid because um, their family is in dire straits, and uh, and so they have not paid their 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 bill because they used it for that purpose. So, so the, the financial constraints are enormous uh, for many of our students. And often what we find is that they are dropping out because they really can't pay, uh, they can't pay their bill. So one of the things that has come a beginning to take, uh, that is beginning to take hold across the country is that organizations are beginning to create funds um, that are emergency funds that can help uh, students stay in school yeah. when there's this very, um, very small amount that they need to finish. And you've said to me sometimes students drop out over very small amounts tiny, of money. Tiny, tiny amounts of money. Um, and, you know, you, and, and those are, it's very heartbreaking when that occurs because, um, because you know that, um, first of all, you know that it's going to affect their ability uh, to be self-sustaining right. uh, when, they, when they do that. Um, but they often come back. And so that six-year graduation rate doesn't mean as much as mm -hmm. a lot of people think. Uh, uh, many policymakers want to see that completion because it seems that it is, um, it's more cost-effective. Right. Um, and it probably is cost-effective. But I honestly, as an educator, I don't care if somebody uh, comes back 
um, later and finishes. And I know many people who have done that very successfully and still gone on. I've also known many people who, by dint of having done just two years of college yeah. or three years of college, have been very, very successful. So to me, the, the, the point is the one that I learned when I was in kindergarten, and that is to learn is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, it, it's nice to tie a bow around it and to say that, um, that you completed your degree. That's good. But at the same time, um, if you are aspiring and you are learning and you're getting better and you're acquiring skills and knowledge, that is actually the most important thing. Okay. It, and so on. So. So I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to, I'm going to open it up, and then I'll come back and ask you a few, a few others. Uh, one of the things you've gotten involved in uh, for the last number of years uh, is the Holtzworth Center. Yes. Which some of you may be familiar with, and we've got the director, Lindsay. You might stand up, introduce. There's Lindsay. Yeah. And this is funded by uh, uh, Charles Butt. And uh, we've talked a lot here about the fact that the state of Texas is lagging in the math. Uh, the country lags the world in math, science, and reading. Texas lags the country. Uh, and we have issues with early childhood literacy uh, and college readiness and all that. And the Holdsworth Center, you've been chair of now. Uh, and I know the theory is to focus on principles, superintendent on the leadership. leadership. But what caused you to do that, and what have you learned from your involvement in the Holdsworth Center about education in the state, or education generally? Well, I mean, I, I mean, every day, at some point in my day, I think about the miracle of education, because there is no way that anyone who uh, grew up as I grew up, should have ever had the career that I've had. No way. Unless education intervenes. That's how powerful it is. And so the idea that this wonderful man, uh, HEB uh, is his, his company, the idea that he would be seized of the idea that a child like me, like I was, ought to have a chance in life. And the best way to give that child a chance is to give them a good education. That, that's a singular, that is, that is the idea that he has. And the, uh, the best way to do that is, of course, to make sure that the schools are well run, uh, that the principals and superintendents and the school boards and everybody who is responsible for organizing that effort are as good as they can be. Um, and so that's his idea, that's what he's committed to. And anybody who comes to me and they, they tell me that they're willing to give that child a chance, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So uh, it, it didn't take much convincing um, to, now when I said I would, I would work with, I, I didn't expect to be chair of the board. Right. That was, <laughs> so. That was a that was a bit of a whammy that came along after after I said yes, but but no, it's 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 a it's uh, Lindsay can attest. Um, it is it is an inspiring enterprise um, that is just getting started, really. Yep. Uh, but we are but it's uh, statewide, um, and we're hoping that we're going to impact leadership uh, of public schools across the state of Texas in a meaningful way. That's great. All right, let's take questions from the, from the audience here. I got plenty more, but let's, I wanna open it up here. You may have to go to the microphone, sorry about that. But uh, we're recording this, and so if you could just, uh, if you go to the mic and ask your question. Hi there, good evening. Um, Shanita Cleveland. And uh, knowing what you know and what you just said about many families being on that edge, even middle class that are right at the edge of going over, you know, and not knowing how they're going to make it, and knowing that the effects of slavery are still all around us uh, through the generations, and that there are even a lot of families that have no uh, one that's gone to college uh, yet because it runs so deep. So do you think that the government should truly charge, especially black people, uh, for an education? Well, um, 
first of all, the government doesn't doesn't charge. It's it's the uh, the 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 systems. Uh, we we don't have a federal system of education uh, in this country, um, and so um, we have the one might say the privilege of having private institutions. We have public institutions, and they're all organized differently around the around the country. Horace Mann, who is the uh, the man who really came up with the idea of universal uh, public education um, for every child, um, uh, uh, probably had in mind something that was a big bit grander than what we actually have. So let me come back to the nub of your question. Um, I don't believe that anyone, when, we con when it comes to children, I don't believe that anyone needs to be privileged. I think a child is a child is a child. And what I would want to see is for every single child sitting in every seat to have the advantage of a good start in life. Okay? Whatever has happened before. You know, we are prisoners of our history, all of us. Whatever has happened before, uh, we need to adjudicate that, yes. But a child is a child is a child. And so... I would like to see us be uniformly agreed that every child des deserves that good start in life. Um, and so that's, what I, so, so that's what I focus on. When it comes to college education, um, uh, you know, you're probably aware from the sound of your question of Georgetown and what they have done recently in regard to um, their own past with slavery. Um, Lots of universities are now doing that. Um, they're coming out with different outcomes depending on the university. And my guess is we'll never really have a uniform outcome. So there might be some university that is inclined to uh, say that African Americans should not pay tuition because of particular things that happened to them during the period of slavery. Um, but not all will. So I don't think that's a solution. Um, I think that that might occur, but I don't think it's going to be a uniform solution. I'm more concerned about the, a uniform solution for our children. What can we do that will be, have the most impact? Um, there are two things about us as, as communities. First is the fact that we live in community. Whether we like it or not, we live in community. I depend on you, and you depend on me. Now, that very fact means that there's some things that we have to negotiate. Okay, It's not a given. We have to negotiate it. We have to agree on how we're going to operate together. So um, the best way, in my view, to do that is for everybody to really be um, uh, uh, completely open to the idea that those conversations need to take place. Um, and that when those conversations, conversations take place, we don't bring anger, we don't bring recrimination, we don't bring all of that baggage to it, because that stops the conversation dead cold. Um, so um, this country is not um, engaged in that. Uh, many countries have. Uh, we're lumbering along to that point. We may get there eventually, but right now we're in dire need of it because what we're doing is exercising our opinions with violence, with, um, with uh, unhealthy behavior, and so on. That's, that's, that's definitely not the thing to do. So education can help if we give every child a fair start. We educate them appropriately. That's a really good way to begin that healing process in this country where everybody has a fair chance and, and a good start. Let me ask just to follow up on that. So if there was one thing you would do to improve that good start, and I know we've talked about the legislative changes that were just made in the state of Texas. Well, is, is there one thing, if you had one, one thing you would, there, I know there's a variety of things, but you have to do one change that you'd like to see made well, I, I to was, improve the child's start, what would it be? I was meeting with... Uh, the uh, superintendent of Cypress Fairbanks uh, Independent School District in Houston. And um, that's a wonderful thing. I just, I, I can't believe they did this. But the citizens of Cypress Fairbanks voted 
to, um, to have an early childhood program for children in Cypress Fairbanks. That's great, yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of that because if you want to see how disparate the conditions are across the country, it, it's, it's staggering how different um, things are for our children. Yeah. Um, and, and I assume it was focused primarily on literacy, proving literacy early? No. It was broader than that? No, no. It's just, it's, these are little children. Okay. okay? So, <laughs> so it, you know, it's, it's the whole gamut, you know, l learning to sit in a chair. Okay. And behave, okay? <laughs> uh, learning the ABC, all the basics. Okay. But uh, along with that, they're socialized. Yeah. To learning, yeah, okay. They are. They have nutrition. Hmm. They are occupied during the day in something other than gaming and television watching, hmm. or not having an adult anywhere around. Um, and so, getting those uh, young uh, children early on hmm. into uh, early right. education gives them a better chance of starting off uh, in elementary school with the skills that they're going to need. Yes, please. Hi, John Bullock. Um, hey, I'm real interested in that also that you talked about so many students being on the edge <clears throat> financially. And um, you know, I'm a small business owner and I think there's a ton of guys like me that would be happy to help. But the problem is I don't know where to send the check. I don't know Let's who talk. to send it to. <laughs> but you know, yeah. There's a lot of folks that would be willing to help, but we don't know how to do it. And I, that's my question. What do we do? Um, there are so many. There are so many different ways. There's so many different ways um, to do this. Um, I, I'm, uh, as I said, there are a number of um, efforts underway with different organizations today to try to meet that. But in, let's say in Texas, or, or if you're Dallas, in Dallas. Um, if you um, were to um, uh, go to the colleges in your area and say, uh, why don't we have a fund that helps to save kids who are on their way and doing well in college and but for a small amount of assistance, they would finish. Uh, and uh, and I, I mean I can you know I can write it up for you actually uh, and the college president? Who would I go to? Uh, there isn't a college president who wouldn't talk to you about something that worthy okay so absolutely uh, and then they would they would refer you to most college presidents you know they don't really do any work uh, <laughs> uh, and so so they would refer you to someone after they talk to you but that's okay that's okay but your so, point is it'd be receptive and people oh, should well, try it of, of, of course but I'll tell you another thing that would happen which is the most beautiful thing and that is the students would love you no, that's, that's not a small thing, because when, when you walk onto a campus as someone who has tried to help students in that way, it elevates everybody, okay? Even the students who don't benefit from it. I remember um, uh, that when I was a, a college student, I, I, there wasn't probably a week that went by that I didn't decide I was going to drop out of college. And I had a lot of good reasons, uh, you know, the boyfriend I had at the time, uh, the, um, the, uh, the fact that I didn't have any money, uh, the fact that I wasn't really going, the fact that I didn't like my professors that semester, whatever it was. Um, the fact that a college uh, a course was very difficult for me. But every time I thought about this one thing, I could not bring myself to do it. And that one thing was somebody had provided money for me to go to college. And that, so, so financial aid, that kind of help elevates people. It elevates their aspirations. It makes them want to uh, persist because of it. We know that. So when I say that students will love you, I mean that the gratitude they have for people, uh, especially anonymous people, anonymous people, Hmm. Giving money 
so that somebody they don't know and will probably never know can go to college is, pro is one of the most powerful things we do in this country. Yes, sir. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Ernest Lloyd. I am a um, graduate of Prairie View A&M University. I'll let my uh, gray hair let you guess what year I actually graduated <laughs> from. And I'm part of those that had a long litany of family to go down. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, the first thing I try to do is go to another prestigious university. After they politely asked me to leave after the first year, um, my family brought me back to Prairie View. <laughs> And I say all this because you mentioned those who are on the six-year plan or the extended plan to graduate. How many of those of you are finding that, um, you know, are making way for, or with their finances but may have some type of difficulty as far as being actually prepared for college? There's one thing that they may study hard and work hard, mm -hmm. but there's another. And also I will say, yes, you will receive my son and my GI Bill <laughs> next semester. Wow. Okay, well... So that's a good question. How many are, it's not financial, they're just not prepared? Um, you know, as an educator, I know people like to talk about this issue of people not being prepared, but honestly, I mean, I, I just don't meet people like that. Hmm. And, uh, and I think it's because, you know, when you've been desperately poor, and when you're the child of uneducated parents, um, you can differentiate between uh, whether or not somebody has had a sequence of courses and whether or not they are just uh, smart and can do all kinds of different things, okay? And so, so many students are learn at different times. I don't assign any value, uh, particularly, to people who have learned at just the right time. And so just because you've been in a school that happened to have calculus and you took it at the right time and therefore you have the prerequisites for the following things, I don't, I don't ascribe any, um, any particular merit to that. You just happen to be lucky, right? Um, I'll never forget the student that I had at... Uh, at, and this is a common problem, actually, also at, at Prairie View. Um, a student that I had at, uh, at Brown, he had gone to the, the worst uh, high school in Providence, um, had not had calculus, and he wanted to be an engineer um, at a very tough engineering school. And um, one faculty member at Brown, the best teacher in the math program, took him and taught him calculus. Hmm. Wow. Today, he, he is a brilliant, he was for a time here in, in Dallas, actually, but today he's a brilliant um, a businessman. Um, uh, and he's completely successful. He looks just like anybody else who would have had the preferred sequence and the preferred timing. So keep in mind that, that we don't throw people away because they haven't had the right course at the right time, which is one of the great things about Prairie View because we take the time to try to help our students um, develop um, according to what they bring to us, not according to we, what we wish they would be. Now, so. Yeah. Fred, Fred Frazier, and of course you're getting a lot of people now who are drugged some of us along uh, <laughs> through various programs in order to make it through engineering and mathematics. Right. And what I was lacking when I went to that unnamed prestigious university was able to catch up with hmm. on the five wow. year extended program. Yeah. <laughs> That's Got great. It. Let's take a couple more, please. Good evening. My name is Keela Williams. I am a ninth grade English one teacher at a wow. school in DISD. Okay. So, my, 
so my question is, as a former educator to current educators, what can we do to inspire our future generation of students, not on a collegiate level, but in high school, to think on a global level so they can continue to be competitive as well as, you know, get what they need out of life and keep going, essentially, and not lose that motivation? I think that's so important. Um, you know, uh, as I said, you know, I grew up under segregation, which marked me indelibly. Um, the one thing that I knew is that, uh, and I knew it instinctively as a very young child, that there was something wrong with that. That the fact that I could not know about people of all kinds and people around the world, I knew that was, had to be wrong. Um, so as a very young child, um, uh, you know, we have these units in, in elementary school where you talk about different cultures and so forth. And, and that's, that's postcard um, kind of tourism. Um, but what you want to do at every opportunity, at every moment, is instill in young people, even at the youngest ages, that they are part of the world and part of their duty as a citizen of the world is to know about other people. And you infuse that in the curriculum constantly, in every conceivable way you can. Um, and uh, you know there are lots of ways to do that, but it obviously had an impact on me. When I was 17 years old, coming out of the segregated environment, I got on a Greyhound bus alone and went to Mexico alone to live with a Mexican family my family thought I was crazy uh, when I did it, but I knew there was something wrong with the model that we use, where we are segregated into enclaves. That's the problem with our country. We are segregated still in enclaves, enclaves of race, enclaves of religion, enclaves of, um, of mm. philosophy, enclaves of um, economic. Uh, make sure that children understand that because someone does not have resources doesn't mean that they don't have the same value as anybody else. So the way we must teach our children is to, teaching them globally is teaching them about human, intrinsic human value and wanting them to know as much as they can know about what there is in, in humanity, uh, because our lives are all about learning that. From the time we're born until the time we leave this earth, we're busy trying to figure people out. We are. And trying to get a sense of why um, one person is motivated one way or why they believe another way. And being open to that and trying to figure that out is the most magnificent thing that we do as human beings. So start it early. Start it early with the youngest children. And if you do that, they're going to be getting on that Greyhound bus and going somewhere and learning something. And that will change their lives. Forever. And one of the great things in my career is that, you know, for me, because I was typecast as this African-American person, and by the way, from the South. Mm -hmm. When I was first appointed at Brown, some faculty said, oh no, oh no. Our next president is going to be, going to be a Texan. <laughs> that was the first thing. And a Baptist. That's so, funny. So anyway, um, that, uh, that's, that's the thing to keep in mind, is that, um, that <laughs> we have these ideas yeah. uh, about, uh, about people. And the fact that I, I was a French scholar, huh. uh, it, it was puzzled everybody. I'm convinced that it's the reason that, that I really became president, because people <laughs> could never figure out a, big, a, a black woman who became um, a, a, a French scholar. Uh, there had to be some value in that. And so, and so I think that's why I made it. 
Hi, my Hi. name is Alicia. I am an alumni from 2008, and I wanted to just know um, what milestones do you feel like you've reached while you've been at Prairie View? And are, I know you're probably not going to be, you're not going to be there forever. And are there any milestones that you hope to achieve during your time there? And is that when you're going to leave, when you hit those marks? Well, I, um, the first thing that I have to say, I mean, this is, this is what I preach to my colleagues in the A&M system, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, look, a university is first and foremost um, an academic institution. And guess what has to come first in a university? <laughs> Academics. So uh, you can talk about anything you want to talk about. You can talk about the climbing walls. You can talk about the landscaping. You can talk about uh, everything else you want to talk about. But if it's rotten at the core in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the faculty ability, in terms of what you're demanding of your students, it's no good. So my, um, my passion is to make sure that we stay focused on the important things. And that is offering the best education we can to our students. And I don't want to hear anybody tell me that we ought to be doing something different from that because the students are needy, because the students are, uh, are, uh, need time to catch up. I, you, students come to my office, do you know what I do? Whatever it is that I do for them, what Aaron Lemonick did for me. So a young man came into my open office hours and you know to see me, and I walked out and I said, "Hello, how are you?" And I you know extended my hand and I said hello, and he extended his hand and he said hello. I said, "What are you doing? Get up! If a woman walks up to you to shake your hand, don't you dare sit down in a chair with your hat on." Okay. So, so uh, what our duty is to encompass all of that for our students because they may, they may not have the opportunity to get it someplace else. So, so a student comes into my office, and uh, as they often do, and they say, Ruth, I wonder if you could help me with this. And then I go through a long peroration about what, we, what they should do. And then I look, and I, they have no paper, no pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and so I say, okay, I said, but are you going to remember any of this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. They're very polite. Uh, yes, ma'am. I said, but, how, but you've taken not a single note. Don't ever come to my office again. Don't ever go see a faculty member again. If you don't have um, notepad and paper or something where you can take notes. So these are the things that we want to do. We want to make people um, aware of the ways in which they can improve greatly on what they learn and how they learn by doing these simple things, which is paying attention, um, retaining things, uh, working above where they think they can work. Another young man came to see me recently and he was saying, you know, I was taking 17 hours and I, you know, uh, and he had a low grade point average. And I said, I don't think you should take 17 hours. And he said, I beg to differ. <laughs> I, I beg to differ. But anyway, so I laughed when he said, I beg to differ. I said, first of all, you don't know anything. So let me, so, <laughs> so let me tell you this. Okay, you think that, the, that college is all about trying to get through as quickly as you can. <laughs> and getting these courses done, but that's not what it's about. It's about doing well and learning deeply. I want you to drop some of these courses that you're taking because a full load is 12 hours. I want you to drop some of these courses and I want you to come back here and tell me that you've improved your grades because you're working harder, you're learning more, you're doing a lot better that's what you're here to do. So uh, what we're trying to do is to create an environment for our students where they can un come to understand this. And I've created a position of Dean of Undergraduate Studies with the charge to make sure the curriculum is what it should be and that somebody is concentrating 100% of the time on whether our students are getting the education they deserve. Wow, so. great, beautiful.
I've got one. Fi- I'm laughing because just we say this all the time here. If you don't have a, pe- if you don't have a pen, where's your notepad? Where's, your where's notepad? Your, where's, take notes. Right. But uh, so, um, so uh, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, we've got uh, uh, a very uh, outstanding group from the community here. Some people have traveled here, but they by by definition, uh, and a number of them are leaders, uh, educators. Uh, very active and leaders in the nonprofit world, former mayors, former government officials, people who care about trying to make the city and the state and the world a better place. If you had to give them uh, one piece of advice, on, and, and we got a little bit of this question here, on, on one or two things or that they could do to help uh, improve education in this country, what would your advice be? Something well, they could do themselves to get involved. Well, the most, to me, the most important thing um, is, is really not to give up on public education. Um, if we give up on public education, those children are lost. Um, large numbers of them lost. Um, that's where we should be concentrating our, our attention. Um, and that means that uh, assisting the public schools in... Um, in meeting the demands, the many demands that they face, uh, is probably, if we improve public education, our jobs get a lot easier in universities. The costs go down dramatically in universities because the students are coming better prepared. Um, So there are so many advantages to focusing on uh, public education that one can hardly uh, state them adequately. Uh, So I think that's, as public officials, um, doing that is enormously, enormously uh, important. Secondly, uh, I'd go back to early uh, childhood education as being uh, critical. Um, Remember that not everybody gets to eat every morning when they get up. Um, uh, Remember that the diet of so many uh, in our community uh, is very poor. Our Dean of Agriculture is here, uh, and one of the things that we are, Please uh, stand Dean up. D'Souza, um, <laughs> and one of the things that we are working on um, is uh, trying to go into the communities uh, and the schools uh, to help with um, the uh, uh, issue of nutrition and food safety. Uh, because uh, you're aware, uh, you know, when, when did we start hearing about food deserts and, and, and so on? But, but it is a crisis, uh, and all, with all of the health problems that ensue as a result of the fact that nutrition is so poor. You know Phillips uh, Academy? Yes. Yeah, so Dr. Flowers. Dr. Flowers, you should stand up. Who, who runs a uh, food pantry as part, in addition to the school, in a food <laughs> desert. Sorry, I don't mean to call it. There are yes. a lot of people who are doing things, but it's, and it'll keep going, sorry. So we're going in, um, uh, they, they have uh, also uh, uh, planted um, uh, gardens uh, in, in schools. Hmm. Um, so having our children focus more on taking, um, not only getting good nutrition, but uh, understanding at a deep level how important this is going to be in their lives. Um, good nutrition, help students uh, it'll, uh, cognitive development. Um, it helps their ability to follow through and do the work that they need to do. Um, and so I, and we can't say enough about how important uh, that is going to be in the future because of these disparate conditions that exist more and more across the country. You know, when I grew, I grew up on, uh, I was born on a farm. And so the fact that my family raised food and that we, uh, although we were very poor, the fact that we had food yeah. uh, was a, a marvelous, uh, marvelous thing. And that has given us the benefit of, of a good life, although most of my sisters and brothers didn't have the advantage of an education uh, because of our circumstances. But you know, my, my, my brother is 90, 91 years old. I have uh, siblings who um, have wonderful, have had wonderful lives because they have had the ability to get a good start um, with, um, with being affiliated with the farm. So Prairie View is an, is an A&M university. The ag school is a defining element of our identity. And so uh, Dean D'Souza is really uh, coming up with ideas that can help uh, really 
um, return the public to the idea of these basics that we have gotten away from. So uh, President Simmons, thank you for your leadership. It's, we've, it's really been an inspiring evening. We could spend a lot longer listening to you uh, talk and talk about your philosophy. I think we've all learned a lot. But again, I want to just say thank you for all that you've done uh, for Prairie View, for the state, for this country, and we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks.